Now it's time for the last word with Jonathan Capehart in for Lawrence. Jonathan, you're, we're covering the swing states tonight. I, I was talking to Colin Allred in Texas, and I'm in Arizona. You're talking to someone in North Carolina, and you're talking about Michigan. Uh, so yep. we're working our way through uh, the places where people are making decisions. Oh, and you left out another state, Pennsylvania, because we've got Senator of Bob course, Casey yes. on. Bob Casey on the show. Ah. So, America, we've got it covered between Allie and me. <laughs> I love it. Well, you have a great show, my friend. I'll be watching. All right, Allie, thank you. There are just 18 days until Election Day and more than 10 million votes have already been cast. And with early voting now underway in Arizona, former President Barack Obama held a rally in Tucson tonight in support of Vice President Harris and Governor Tim Walz. He said this about Donald Trump. Donald Trump wants us to think that this country is hopelessly divided between us and them, between the, quote, real Americans, which, by which he means his supporters, and, and the outsiders who don't support him. Because having people divided and angry and aggrieved and resentful he figures that boosts his chances to get elected. Now, so, so those are his intentions. I, I, I do have to point out that along with his intentions, there is also a question of his competence. <laughs> have you seen him lately? I mean, he is out there, he's given two, two and a half hour speeches, just word salads. You, you have no idea what he's talking about. He's talking about Hannibal Lecter. He's talking about this. He's talking about that. He held a town hall meeting where he's, he, he just, let, let me explain, because I've done a lot of town hall meetings. The point of a town hall meeting is to take questions. He just decided, you know what, I'm going to stop taking questions. And then he's swaying to Ave Maria and YMCA for about half an hour. Folks are standing there not sure what's happening. Can you imagine if, if, if I did that? Can, can you imagine if Ruben did that right in the middle? Now, our playlist would probably be better. But... <clears throat> He called himself the father of IVF. I do not know what that means. You do not either. He said January 6th was a day of love. Do not boo, vote. It made, made, made January 6th sound like it was Woodstock. You. You would be worried if your grandpa was acting like this. No, no, I'm, I'm not joking. You would, right? You'd, be, you'd, 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 you'd call up your cousins and you'd say, have you noticed? So imagine it coming from a guy who wants to be given unchecked power. For Donald Trump and his cronies, freedom means that the powerful can do whatever they please. That's his definition of, pre of freedom. I want to fire workers for trying to organize a union. I should be free to do so. You know, they, they're, they're, they, they want the freedom to throw out votes if, if they lose an election. They, they, want the, they want to control what women can and can't do to their bodies. It, it, in, in, in other words, for Trump, freedom is getting away with stuff. And, and it's like he said in the middle of the pandemic, when he said, I do not take any responsibility at all. I'm not sure any American president has ever uttered those words other than Donald Trump. I do not take any, people were dying. Hospitals overrun. I do not take any responsibility at all. That's his idea of freedom. I do what I want, and I'm not responsible for anything. We have a broader idea of freedom. We believe in the freedom to provide 
for our families if we're willing to work. The freedom to breathe clean air and drink clean water. The freedom to send our kids to school without worrying if they'll come home safely. We believe that true freedom gives each of us the right to make decisions about our own lives. How we worship, who we marry, what our family looks like. And we also believe that freedom requires us to recognize that other people have the freedom to make different choices. And it doesn't make them bad people, it doesn't make them evil people. It doesn't make them enemies of the state. On Tuesday, Barack Obama and Tim Walz are headed to Wisconsin for the first day of early voting in that state. Barack Obama wasn't the only one campaigning in a critical battleground state today. The Democratic candidate herself, Kamala Harris, was in Michigan today holding events throughout the state. Here's what Vice President Harris said in Oakland County, Michigan, just a few hours ago. We are the underdog and running as the underdog, but make no mistake, we will win. We will win. We will win. Yes, we will. We will win. And we will win because we understand, and we will win because we understand what is at stake. America is ready to chart a new way forward, ready for a new and optimistic generation of leadership that is all of you, is all of us, which is why Democrats, Republicans, independents are supporting our campaign. In fact, you may have seen earlier this week over 100 Republican leaders from across the country joining me on the campaign trail. <laughs> Including some who served under Donald Trump's administration. Because, you know, they know him best. They understand what's at stake. And I believe Americans want a president and deserve a president who works for all the American people. <laughs> the story of my entire career. I've only in my career had one client, the people. One client. As a young courtroom prosecutor, I protected women and children. As Attorney General of California, I fought for students and veterans who were being scammed by those for-profit colleges. As Vice President, I have stood up for workers and seniors. And as President, I will fight for all the American people, always. Trump has a different approach. I don't need to tell you he's full of big promises, but always fails to deliver. Always fails to deliver. So remember he said he was the only one, you know how he talks, the only one <laughs> who could bring back America's manufacturing jobs. Remember when he said that? America lost almost 200,000 manufacturing jobs when he was president, including tens of thousands of jobs right here in Michigan. And those losses started before the pandemic, okay? 
making Donald Trump one of the biggest losers of manufacturing jobs in American history. Donald Trump was also in Michigan today, where he held a rally tonight in Detroit, his first time back since insulting the city. Spoiler alert, it didn't go so well. It's not love. It's not respect. And that was after it was reported that Trump was having trouble filling seats at that rally. Trump fans, perhaps even Trump himself, may be tired of his act. The 78-year-old Republican candidate canceled an appearance at the Trump-friendly NRA next week due to campaign scheduling changes. In recent days, Donald Trump has canceled an interview with 60 Minutes CNBC and an interview with NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans. Could it be because he doesn't want to answer questions about yet another stock market record close under the Biden administration? You can always count on Fox to deliver that great news. We have green on the screen here. Dow is at a record. The S&P is at a record. This could change, though, in five minutes because these numbers are pretty close. The Dow is up 38. The S&P is up 23. S&P needs a gain of 18. The major averages for the week are tracking their sixth straight week of gains. The Dow and S&P, longest winning streaks of the year. Or is Donald Trump just suffering from exhaustion? Today, Politico reports that Donald Trump has also can canceled his appearance on The Shade Room, where earlier this week, Vice President Harris sat down with the Black-owned independent media company. Politico reports, quote, a Trump advisor told Shade Room producers that Trump was exhausted in refusing some interviews, but that could change at any time, according to two people familiar with the conversations. Today, Vice President Harris addressed those reports. I've been hearing reports that his team at least is saying he's suffering from exhaustion. And um, that's apparently the excuse for why he's not doing interviews. And of course, he's not doing the CNN town hall. Um, he refuses to do another debate. And, you know, look, being president of the United States is probably one of the hardest jobs in the world. And so we really do need to ask if he's exhausted being on the campaign trail. Um, is he fit to do the job? And I think that's a question that is an open ended question that he needs to answer. Donald Trump did make time to visit Fox and Friends, where he said this. What's your favorite farm animal? Favorite farm animal. <laughs> What's that animal? <laughs> well, this guy you know, grew up in the city. <laughs> I'll tell you what I love. I love cows. But if we go with Kamala, you won't have any cows anymore <laughs> because you're not allowed. And then he seems to suggest that Abraham Lincoln could have avoided the Civil War. Lincoln was probably a great president, although I've always said, why wasn't that settled? You know, I'm a guy that it doesn't make sense. We had a civil war. Well, half the country uh, left horrible. before he got there. Yeah, yeah. But you'd almost say, like, why wasn't that? As an example, Ukraine would have never happened in Russia if I were president. After receiving that history lesson from the Fox host, Donald Trump seems to not know or not care that Abraham Lincoln took office after many slave states seceded to form the Confederacy because the Confederate states were for slavery, unlike the Union, which was not. It was also treason against the United States of America. Why wasn't it settled? Who can know? Today, The Atlantic published an article titled, Trump is speaking like Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini, saying, quote, Trump blurs the distinction between illegal immigrants and legal immigrants, the latter including his wife, his late ex-wife, the in-laws of his running mate, and many others. He has said of immigrants, they're poisoning the blood of our country and they're destroying the blood of our country. 
He has claimed that many have bad genes. He also, he has also been more explicit. They're not humans. They're animals. They are cold-blooded killers. He refers more broadly to his opponents, American citizens, some of whom are elected officials as the enemy from within, sick people, radical left lunatics. Not only do they have no rights, they should be handled by, he has said, if necessary, National Guard, or if really necessary, by the military. In using this language, Trump knows exactly what he is doing. Here's what Governor Waltz had to say about Donald Trump's rhetoric in North Carolina yesterday. He was at a town hall, but he got asked a real question. He got asked why he and his running mate are making up stories about legal migrants in this company, <laughs> doubling down on disgusting stories and telling lies that the Republican officials in these areas are saying that's lies. The, the Republican governor of Ohio had to send state patrol to escort kindergartners to school because of the stuff they're saying. So look, look, they're begging him to stop. But okay, let, let's acknowledge this. There are outsiders coming into communities, stealing jobs, making life worse for people there, and they have names, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Those are the people coming there. Those are the people coming there. Governor Walls was in Winston-Salem yesterday campaigning with former President Bill Clinton and rapper Common for the first day of early voting in the state. The New York Times reports, quote, more than 353,000 people cast ballots, a record for first day of early voting. Leading off our discussion tonight is Anderson Clayton, chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Uh, Anderson, uh, great to see you again. Thank you very much for being here. Tell us how you see North Carolina's record-breaking early voting numbers yesterday. Thanks for having us, Jonathan. Uh, I think what we saw in North Carolina yesterday was everything that we wanted to in terms of high record turnout across the state in our counties that we wanted to see, like Mecklenburg and Wake, uh, but also long lines that I think made it so that even our rural counties, we saw people excited to get out and vote for Democrats up and down the ballot this year and for decency on the ballot this year. Your state is still dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. The New York Times reports, quote, the political consequences of the storm remain unclear. Christopher A. Cooper, a political science professor at Western Carolina University, conducted an analysis of 2020 voting data and found that in 13 counties affected by Helene, roughly 55 percent of the votes went to Mr. Trump and 45 percent to Joseph R. Biden Jr. So, Anderson, are you worried about low voter turnout in those counties? We are doing everything to make sure that folks that have been devastated by Hurricane Helene have every right and ever able to access their constitutional right to the ballot box this year in every way possible. Anyone in the state of North Carolina that's been questioning how do they get to the ballot box, if you're in a county that's been disaffected, can go to the website the State Board of Elections has set up, especially for those folks in CSBE backslash Helene. And so making sure that we are advocating for that to people out in Western North Carolina in those state or in those counties that have been affected in the state, and then also ensuring that we've got a voter protection hotline that is manned 24-7 in North Carolina to ensure that anyone that calls it is able to get the help that they need to. Uh, Anderson, is there a firewall number Democrats are hoping to hit in the early vote? Well, we're hoping to uh, beat 2020 numbers, which is what we're doing right now. And so we're expected to see at least that turnout continue. We saw it today on NCCU's campus. I got to go to Souls to the polls and meet with folks out there who were excited to get out and vote, some of them for the first time. We are seeing record turnout in many places that we need to across the state, but only time is going to tell. So if you're somebody in North Carolina that's not gotten out to vote yet, or you know someone that hasn't, you should get out and knock doors with us this weekend and talk to those voters. Mm. Uh, you can go to ncdp.org and backslash knock to get started with us. We well, anticipated my, my next question for you. We are 18 days away from Election Day. What would be the most effective way to get out the vote in North Carolina, not only for president, but also for governor? 
definitely we are looking at the most competitive races up and down the ballot, not just our governor's race this year with Mark Robinson, who's running our current lieutenant governor right now, but also people like Michelle Morrow running for superintendent, who said she'd like to see the public execution of President Barack Obama. She's someone that belongs nowhere near our school children, and we need to make sure we elect Mo Green this year, who's running on the Democratic ticket and someone that has been a champion of our public schools. And we're expecting everybody to feel the energy from those races down ballot like Council of State and our judicial races this year. Our Supreme Court race is so important with Justice Allison Riggs on the ballot. We've seen the corruption in our courts when they're backing up our state legislature that has taken far too much power in the Republican superman or supermajority right now that we find ourselves in in North Carolina. So every race up and down the ballot is important and we're knocking doors everywhere to ensure that folks get out and know the stakes. Anderson Clayton, thank you for coming to The Last Word. And coming up, almost one million voters in Michigan have already cast their ballots in the general election. We'll talk to Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson next about concerns she's hearing from Michigan voters ahead of going to the ballot box. That's next. Hey, everyone. It's Rachel Maddow, and I have a new movie. It's called From Russia with Lev. It's the first documentary from my new production company. It centers on one of the key guys from the ridiculous and terrible and terribly stupid scheme that led to Donald Trump's first impeachment. At the Miami premiere of the film, the great Katie Fang moderated a conversation between Lev Parnas and his wife Svetlana and the film's director, Billy Corbin, and me. And you can hear that conversation ad-free with an MSNBC premium subscription on Apple Podcasts. You can find this new podcast in the Rachel Maddow Show podcast feed. MSNBC Premium gets you new episodes of The Rachel Maddow Show and all of MSNBC's original podcasts, all ad-free. Subscribe to MSNBC Premium on Apple Podcasts. What's causing the rise in book banning? On my podcast, Velshi Ban Book Club, I speak with authors of banned books to try and find out. I think what they're really objecting to is that a young person has perceived the hypocrisy and corruption of the generation that has created their world. This book saved me in a lot of ways, and then I published it hoping to help people find a blueprint to heal. Season two of Velshi Ban Book Club. Listen now. The World with Richard Engel and Yalda Hakim is a brand new podcast from Sky News. With me, Sky News' lead world news presenter, Yalda Hakim. And me, Richard Engel, Chief Foreign Correspondent for NBC News. Every week, we'll be reporting from the front line of the world's trouble spots and asking the big questions to the world's most important and influential people. Join us for the ground truth to help you understand what is happening in the world today and why it matters to you. So that's The World with Richard Engel and Yalda Hakim. Listen every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcast. The people of the state of Michigan will not be intimidated. One of the seven battleground states where Donald Trump plotted to overturn the 2020 presidential election, Michigan has been a focal point of some of the most chilling threats of political violence from the MAGA movement. Over the past four years, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson has been threatened, had pro protesters show up to her home, and been targeted in swatting incidents. She's spoken about some of those experiences on this show. In 2022, before the January 6th Select Committee, Benson delivered a gripping account about one of them. About 45 minutes later, we started to hear the noises outside my home. And that's I, my stomach sunk. And I thought, it's me. And, they're, and, and then it's just, we don't know what's going mean, to, the uncertainty of that was what was the fear. Like, are they coming with guns? Are they going to attack my house? I'm in here with my kid. You know, it's, I'm trying to put him to bed. And so it was, um, yeah, that was the scariest moment, just not knowing what was going to happen. Benson isn't alone. Michigan, after all, is the state where Trump campaign operative Michael Roman reportedly said he wanted to start a riot at Detroit's TCF Center after votes started pouring in at that polling site for Joe Biden. Make them riot, Roman said on November 4th, 2020, according to a recent bombshell filing by special, prosecutor, special counsel Jack Smith. Do it, Roman added. Michigan is one of the states where fake Trump electors are being criminally prosecuted. 
In a still pending lawsuit in Washington, D.C., a Michigan civil rights group called out Trump for openly seeking to disenfranchise black voters. The first version of the lawsuit, which focused on the Trump campaign's actions in Detroit, said, quote, defendants' tactics repeated the, repeat the worst abuses in our nation's history, as black Americans were denied a voice in American democracy for almost for most of the first two centuries of the republic. The NAACP later joined that lawsuit in an amended complaint accusing Trump of violating the Reconstruction-era Ku Klux Klan Act by systematically targeting cities with large black populations. Nevertheless, Michigan voters persisted. And this morning, Benson announced on X that 944,819 people have already voted, writing, quote, with over two weeks to go until the polls close November 5th, Already, almost one million citizens have voted in Michigan. Three exclamation points. This is great news for democracy. All across our state, folks are engaged and enthusiastic about voting this year. Let's go. Secretary Benson still faces challenges. This past August, Benson's home was targeted in two separate swatting incidents within 48 hours, a form of political violence where callers report hoax calls to law enforcement to provoke an armed response. Benson is also fending off lawsuits trying to erode confidence in the election, including a case that the Republican Party's state and national branches filed challenging overseas votes, including by military voters. More than 16,000 are at issue in that case, and nearly a million people have voted absentee already, before early voting has even begun. We'll check on the status of those ballots in just a moment. 18 days until Election Day, and we'll see how long it takes until we get an election outcome. Joining us now is Jocelyn Benson, Secretary of State for the great state of Michigan. Secretary Benson, thank you very much for being here. We know absentee ballots are going to be something Republicans target. What assurance do voters have their early vote will be counted? Well, first, thanks for having me, Jonathan. Great to see you, and thanks for your great work. Uh, in Michigan, you can actually track your ballot online if you vote from home and mail it back in at michigan.gov slash vote, so you can see that your ballot has been received and counted, and call your clerk if you see any discrepancies. So that level of transparency helps voters stay informed and engaged so that they can rise above the noise and actually see the truth in this moment and have confidence that their vote will count. Uh, Michigan Republicans filed a lawsuit against you challenging overseas and military voting. Did they miscalculate going after our troops? Have any members of the military told you they're worried about their vote? You know, I'm a military spouse, so I know firsthand how important it is for our service members and their families serving overseas to have assurances that their vote will count. And so I've made it a priority of my administration to ensure that every vote counts, including those of our service members. And it's mind boggling to me that in the dozens of lawsuits we're seeing in Michigan and around the country, this was the game. This was what they choose to pick on. It's, it's, you know, perfectly legal and Indeed, citizens overseas are entitled under the law to be able to vote in the states of their residents back here. So the their protections are clear, but it's directly why they went after us for registering veterans uh, to uh, vote when we partnered with the Veterans Affairs Agency earlier this year. It's a very strange strategy, but the law is clear and we will always side with making sure every citizen can vote and that every voice is heard. Secretary Benson, what lessons did you learn four years ago that you're using for this election? to stand strong in the face of those threats. The, the, the currency that those challenging democracy play with or run in is trying to make people feel afraid, afraid to vote, afraid to stand in defense of valid, accurate election results. Uh, and what I felt that night when people gathered outside my home was fear, but also a resilience, a determination to protect the will of the voters. And that is really what we bring now, all of us in Michigan, and frankly, my colleagues in battleground states around the country, a defiance and a determination 
that we've been emboldened by these threats and attacks, and we're going to ensure democracy prevails. And we want citizens to stand with us. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent, as Eleanor Roosevelt told us. So we need to, in this moment, stand firm, not allow efforts to intimidate us to be successful, and instead use that energy to be courageous in this moment and ensure that every voice is heard in this historic election. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, thank you. Thanks for having me. And coming up, Pennsylvania clinched the presidency for Joe Biden in 2020. Even hotly contested Bucks County went to Joe Biden with 17,000 more votes than Donald Trump. Our next guest, a writer born in Bucks County, has gone back to his county to talk to voters to see where they stand on Donald Trump this year. That's next. Hi, everyone. It's Joy Reid. I'd like to share a special project I think you'll enjoy. It's a podcast from MSNBC and Wondery that I hosted in 2020 called Kamala, Next in Line. It explores then-Senator Kamala Harris's background as she made the rounds as Joe Biden's running mate and tells the stories that shaped the woman we know today. Since Vice President Harris has ascended to the top of the Democratic ticket, we're making the podcast available ad-free for MSNBC Premium subscribers on Apple Podcasts. It's an insightful window into the person who could become our next president. You can find it on the How to Win 2024 feed. When you subscribe to MSNBC Premium, you can also listen to all of MSNBC's original podcasts and more ad-free and with bonus content. Subscribe to MSNBC Premium on Apple Podcasts to enjoy Kamala Next in Line ad-free, plus all the benefits available only to subscribers. Joe Biden won Pennsylvania by more than 80,000 votes in 2020. In hotly contested Bucks County, Joe Biden beat Donald Trump by 17,000 votes. That battle for the American presidency went through dozens of towns and villages in Bucks County. Like the town of Regalsville, population 800, where Donald Trump beat Joe Biden by two votes, 276 to 274 in 2020. Two votes. Recently, a writer born in Bucks County went back to where he grew up to talk to voters about the 2024 election, and it is illuminating, especially about the Trump voters. Michael Sokolov writes, Harris supporters liked her, even if some felt they were still getting to know her, and they trusted that she would govern as a sort of standard issue Democrat. The Trump supporters had a more complicated story to tell. They did not express fears that Ms. Harris would take away their guns or, for that matter, even mention if they owned guns. None of them were QAnon-level conspiracy theorists who claimed that Democrats were pedophiles. In other words, they did not seem insane. But in their defense of Mr. Trump, of his serial lying, his misogyny, his role in the January 6th insurrection, they offered a range of explanations and rationalizations that did not align with any knowable reality. I asked them about Mr. Trump's business history, which includes six bankruptcies, numerous instances of cheating as vendors, and years of paying minimal or no federal taxes. Their responses were similar to what I heard from other Trump supporters. They accept that the rich play by different rules. Rather than resentment, they expressed admiration. Quote, every rich businessman goes bankrupt, one Trump supporter said. But Michael Sokolov doesn't leave it there. The Trump voters' stated reasons for supporting Trump don't match reality, but the voters aren't crazy. So he continues to probe for an explanation, and he landed on this. What if what his supporters really want and do not express is the Trump vibe? All the name-calling, coarseness, and bullying, the hyper-masculine authoritarian rhetoric. Mr. Trump is peddling that poison like political crack, and half the nation is hooked, the other half repulsed. If it works and he's, he is elected, it promises four more years of national political warfare. Joining us now is Michael Sokolov, contributing writer at the New York Times and Bucks County native. Michael, it was a terrific, terrific story to read. Um, 
talking to Trump voters in 2024 is different than 2016. No one can claim in 24 to not know who he is, a convicted felon, sexual assaulter, instigator of the January 6th attack. Didn't sound like you found a lot of holding their nose Trump voters. It seems like they're comfortable with their choice. That's exactly right. And, you know, I went there really trying to have long conversations and explore how people were feeling. And what I really came away with was that there is a whole segment of the country that no longer hopes for a president to be someone we admire or want our children to look up to, you know, a, a war hero like Dwight Eisenhower or a trailblazer like Barack Obama, a straight arrow like Jimmy Carter. People have gotten, I think, very cynical and low in their expectations and accepting that not only this is who Donald Trump is, they don't care, but also imagining that that might be who Kamala Harris is. Well, we don't know enough about her, but that's who politicians are, even though there's no evidence that Kamala Harris is you know, personally corrupt. She's had a long career in public service. You know, there's a difference between these two people that's pretty obvious in their personal values and personal conduct. And what I found in this sweet little town is people who have convinced themselves that, you know, this era in America is over where we are going to look up to a president. You know, what, what do you think is behind the attraction to the hyper-masculine authoritarian rhetoric, rhetoric of Donald Trump's? That's a really big question. Um, you know, for a lot of men, it's, it's something maybe that they've grown used to with Ultimate Fighting Challenge or reality TV. I just think we've become sort of inured to it, this coarseness. And, you know, Trump's been around for, what, eight, nine, ten years on, on the national stage. It just seems to go back, go, go past people. But if you if you really listen to it, you know, it's to many of us, it's it's dangerous. It's disturbing. It's blaming migrants, you know, in a way that that we haven't seen since, you know, Europe in the 40s. It's blaming Jews for being, you know, ungrateful for all he's done for them. I mean, this is really out there stuff. And I honestly think it goes past people. Uh, but there's also certainly an attraction to some of it. Mm -hmm. I, I was curious about this comment from a Trump voter, and I'll put this on the screen. It was a mistake, the retired car dealer said of Mr. Trump's role in the overturning of Roe v. Wade. He said his wife, daughters, and granddaughters were all voting for Ms. Harris, and some had contributed to her campaign. The abortion thing is going to kill him. You said you didn't find anyone who changed their vote from, from 2020. But has the Dobbs decision created a wild card? I think it certainly has. And, you know, these were a bunch of old guys in their in their 80s who I sat with <clears throat> for a couple of mornings outside the general store. And they were colorful. One of the men said mm -hmm. he used to run a gin mill. Uh, but they were pretty smart. They were pretty savvy. They were Trump voters. And they really focused on abortion as, oh, he, you know, th this is something that our wives and our daughters are not good with. And they see that happening. And they see um, the younger women influencing um, their husbands. So they're certainly aware of that as a, as a big factor. They're still with Trump. Hmm. Michael Sokolov, The New York Times, thank you very much for coming to The Last Word and for that terrific story. Thanks for having me. And coming up, control of the Senate could come down to one of the most closely watched races in Pennsylvania, where Democratic Senator Bob Casey is synonymous with Pennsylvania and is calling out his Republican challenger for living in Connecticut for many years. Senator Bob Casey will join us next. The road to the American presidency runs through Pennsylvania, and the road to the Supreme Court and every other federal judge in the cabinet runs through the United States Senate. We can have a Senate controlled by the party that put Katanji Brown Jackson on the court, or the party that put Brett Kavanaugh and two other Trump justices on the court. Those are the stakes of this election. 
one of the races that will determine control of the Senate is in Pennsylvania, where incumbent Democratic Senator Bob Casey is locked in a tight race with his Republican challenger, former hedge fund CEO Dave McCormick. And just like John Fetterman capitalized on questions about Jersey boy Mehmet Oz's Pennsylvania residency, Senator Bob Casey is taking a similar approach with Dave McCormick as he did in the final debate on Tuesday. The campaign that we're in today started with this candidate, Mr. McCormick, starting the race, lying to the people of Pennsylvania about where he lives. How do you lie about where you live when you're running for an office where you seek to represent the people of our state? He said he was living in Pennsylvania. He wasn't. He was living in Connecticut. He also lied about how he grew up. He said at one point he was a farmer and that he grew up on a farm. If this is a question about who's been telling a lie, how do you lie to the people about where you live? Uh, The latest attack came after a major goof by Dave McCormick for Pennsylvania sports fans. He seemed to confuse the Philadelphia Eagles and Pittsburgh Steelers football teams, posting on social media at an Eagles game on Sunday, quote, fun tailgate in Philly today, excited to watch the Steelers throttle the Raiders. (laughs) Even I know the Philadelphia team is the Eagles. The Pittsburgh Steelers are from the other side of the state. A McCormick campaign spokesperson told Newsweek, quote, that a mistake had not been made and that McCormick is a lifelong Steelers fan and Pittsburgh resident. (laughs) Cheering for the local team is kind of a layup for a politician. You shouldn't have to explain it. (laughs) Sorry. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. He is running for re-election this year. Senator Casey, always great to see you. You've been targeting McCormick as not being from Pennsylvania. Is that resonating with voters? Jonathan, I think it is, and it's great to be with you. I think it's resonating because people have a sense in their daily lives that uh, sometimes uh, these campaigns are distant from their their daily struggles, the cost of living, and issues that that are so close to to people's lived experience, whether it's the the cost of food or household items or housing or childcare. And when when they hear about a candidate who's uh, not living in the state and 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 did lie to the people of our state about where he was living, I think they have a sense that not only has he not been there, but he's in this case he was living in a. $16 $16 million mansion in Connecticut. So it does impact, I think, how they see the race. But despite all these arguments back and forth, and we've we've had a, a vigorous debate in the campaign, this is a very close race. It's probably probably not even those four points you saw. It's probably mm-hmm. a two-point race, and some days a one-point race. And the principal reason for that is uh, this guy has a, a small group of billionaires that have funded a huge super PAC that was set up just for him. And that super PAC, one super PAC set up for one candidate has already outspent my entire campaign. So I'd ask folks, if you want to help us beat those billionaires, and by the way, they're out-of-state billionaires, like the guy they're supporting, please go to bobcasey.com. So our last guest spoke to Pennsylvania voters from a small town in Bucks County, none of whom plan to shift from how they voted in 2020. Senator, are there minds that can be changed with 18 days to go? I think there are, but it's a small number. But um, the, the reporting that, that uh, was, was done that, that uh, formed the basis of that column uh, by Mr. Sokolov was in Bucks County. That's, a, that's kind of a 5149 county. So I think it's gonna be close regardless. But uh, we've got to continue to earn the vote of the people of, of Bucks County, just like Kamala Harris is working to do every day. And uh, that's an important county. I was just in Erie County tonight and a lot of energy and intensity there. And that's also a county that was decided by uh, less than two points in both 20, uh, 2016 and 2020. Um, Elon Musk is in Pennsylvania spreading Trump's lies about voter fraud and pushing the legal line with a cash for signatures offer to registered voters. Senator, how do you combat that kind of disinformation? 
Well, first of all, making sure that, that folks know uh, all the, the details about uh, registration. Our registration ends on the 21st of October, just a couple of days away. And also that people ha have a continuing sense of what's at stake. Um, but sometimes the disinformation is hard to, to combat. But we've got to continue to make sure that people know what's at stake. Basic rights at stake, as you made reference to earlier. Uh, women's rights, workers' rights, voting rights, all on the ballot uh, in this race, in addition to the usual debates we have about tax policy and health care and so much else. But I think people are, are, are engaged and they're paying attention. I think it's going to be harder to be successful uh, to purvey uh, misinformation, but we've got to continue to make sure that people know what's at stake. If we continue to do that, people will vote, and I think it'll be a high turnout. What was that website again, Senator? BobCasey.com. And I need your help because those billionaires are still kicking in a lot of money. Senator Bob Casey of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. And we'll be right back. Before we go, a reminder for you, you can join me this weekend on the Saturday show and the Sunday show, both at 6 p.m. Eastern. And on Sunday, we'll react to the brand new interview with Vice President Kamala Harris after she joins the Reverend Al Sharpton on Politics Nation at 5 p.m. Eastern. That's all here on, M on MSNBC. Hey, everyone, it's Chris Hayes. This week on my podcast, Why Is This Happening? My friend and host of the weekend on MSNBC, Simone Sanders Townsend. I think the first year of the Biden-Harris administration and her vice presidency was a foundational year and led directly to everything that we are seeing right now. And I was there that first year. And one of the things that we learned in trial by error and from a staff perspective is that, yes, her name is number two on the door. However, she also wasn't just plucked out of the ether. That's this week on Why Is This Happening? Search for Why Is This Happening wherever you're listening right now and follow.